I'm going to talk to you about space colonization, the race to the heavens, if you will. For many years, the global network has been saying that the nuclear industry views space as a new market. They've long envisioned nuclear-powered mining colonies on the moon and Mars and destinations beyond. The recent announcement by NASA of a new nuclear reactor power system that would enable uh, long-duration space colonies only confirms our worst fears. Accidents at or soon after launch with nuclear payloads would endanger our fragile Earth environment. But even more troubling is the history of Department of Energy laboratory accidents as they fabricate these nuclear generators for space missions. Worker contamination and release of radioactive contamination into the air and local uh, water supplies has been a problem revealing that space nuclear power is killing people even before a launch might occur. Just one example was in 1997 when the Cassini mission was launched with 72 pounds of plutonium on it. Just right before the launch, uh, the Santa Fe, New Mexico newspaper reported that there were 244 cases of worker contamination in New Mexico as they were fabricating the generators for that particular mission. In a congressional study published in 1989 entitled Military Space Forces the Next 50 Years, the author explains the value of having the U.S. control the Earth-Moon gravity well. He writes, quote, Nature reserves decisive advantage for L4 and L5, two allegedly stable vibration points on either side of the moon that theoretically could dominate Earth and the moon because they look down on both gravity wells. No other location is equally commanding. Armed forces might lay in wait at that location to hijack rival shipments upon return to Earth. He continues, military space forces at the bottom of the Earth's so-called gravity well are poorly positioned to accomplish offensive, defensive, deterrent missions because great energy is needed to overcome gravity during launch. Forces at the top on a space counterpoint of high ground could initiate action and detect, identify, track, intercept, or otherwise respond more rapidly to attacks. Put simply, he said, it takes less energy to drop objects down a well than to cast them out. It seems rather obvious to me that the Pentagon's Space Weapons Technology Program has two distinct goals. One is to control Earth on behalf of corporate interests. And the other is to develop the necessary technologies to control the pathway or the front gate on and off the planet Earth. Trump declared support for the creation of a separate branch of the military, the Space Force. It's an indication that the aerospace industry has taken firm control of his administration. The industry stands to make massive profit if such a separate Space Force, Space Warrior Force, can be created, which would necessitate huge infusions of money into a program that the industry has long maintained would be the largest industrial project in the history of planet Earth, Star Wars. I like to refer to it as pyramids to the heavens. The Air Force is opposed 
to the space force. They want to control the seamless web between the Earth and deep space. The bill to create the space war force has passed in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, but not, uh, did not get approval in the U.S. Senate. The bill will likely come back for another try, especially now that Trump has recently endorsed the proposal again, just in re recent days. As technology begins to enable resource extraction on planetary bodies, the legal question of who can mine the sky and who can't will become a great source of conflict between nations. Pentagon documents have long maintained that an important role for U.S. military space forces would be to control who is allowed to leave the Earth to mine the sky and to return with enormous profits imagined from such an undertaking. This would ensure that war in the heavens would no longer be a theoretical consideration. It would become a reality as the U.S. enforced its mission of master of space on behalf of selected corporate interests. The use of nuclear power for military space operations to power weapons in space has always been on the Pentagon's drawing board. The mix of nuclear power and space warfare is a deadly connection that must be avoided at all cost. We must continue to build international opposition to these frightening nuclear plans. In 2015, Obama signed the U.S. Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act into law. The law recognizes the right of U.S. citizens to own asteroid resources that they obtain and encourages the commercial exploration and utilization of resources from asteroids. Quote, this is the single greatest recognition of property rights in history, said Eric Anderson, co-chairman of Planetary Resources, Inc. This legislation establishes the same, uh, the same supportive framework that created the great economies of history and will encourage the sustained development of space. Peter Diamandis, the other co-chairman of Planetary Resources, Inc. said, a hundred years from now, Humanity will look at this period in time as the point in which we were able to establish a permanent foothold in space. In history, there has never been a more rapid rate of progress than right now. During the late 1990s, a group called United Societies in Space, along with the World Bar Association, published a series of uh, uh, booklets entitled Space Governance. Their goal was to rewrite international space law as the UN's Outer Space Treaty and Moon Treaties have declared that the planetary bodies are the province of all humankind. The UN said there could be no private claims made on any solar system body. The UN correctly was trying to preempt the eventual global conflict that would rise if private property claims were allowed in space. Declan O'Donnell, one of the leaders of the group at the time, wrote, quote, We are the fifth force in nature. Our society turned loose in the universe armed with energy, cut free from the bounds of gravity, driven by a consensus destiny, and now organized under the idea of self-governance, will represent a new natural force. Our abilities can be focused 
Under this protective umbrella, he said, our mansions can be built with a new source of financing. Joining arms with our national efforts and priming the pump for private enterprise. Meta Nation, he said, the new space governance vessel under construction by United Societies in Space Incorporated intends to bring synergy to space. Also in this book was a piece written by Marshall Savage, author of Millennial Project, Colonizing the Galaxy in Eight Easy Steps. He stated, quote, the proper place for atomic power can be seen if we look at it through the focal plane of lunar development. On the moon, the distinction between ecology and wasteland will be starkly defined. We can't really mess up the moon, either by mining it or building nuclear power plants. We can ruthlessly strip mine the surface of the moon for centuries, and it will be hard to tell we've even been there. The same is true of atomic power, he said. We could wage unlimited nuclear war on the surface of the moon and be hard pressed after the dust had settled to tell anything had even happened. There's no reason why we cannot build nuclear power plants on the moon's surface with impunity. In his 1996 book, Mining the Sky, Untold Riches from the Asteroids, Comets, and Planets, former NASA official John Lewis said, quote, Indeed, the global expansion of European technology and civilization brought about the terrestrial age of exploration. But it's a pale foreshadowing of the opportunities before us as humans move out into space. The U.S. Space Command, in their well-known 1997 document, Vision for 2020, made clear how they saw their role in the future as space colonization became possible due to taxpayer-funded technology, research, and development. The Global Network was created 26 years ago to sound the alarm, to wake up the sleeping masses who are thrilled by the images of Elon Musk sending hot rods into space. Our goal has always been to steadily build an international constituency who understand the plans for global control and domination and who can then help us build a new consciousness on Earth about what kind of seed we carry with us as we inevitably journey into space. Will we carry the bad seed of greed, private property, control and domination, and ultimately war into the heavens? Or shall we carry the good seed of inquiry, cooperation, imagination, and peace as rockets lift off from our tiny space satellite called Earth? This is why we meet here in Oxford this weekend. We wish to continue to raise these fundamental questions and move together around our planet to ensure that we keep space for peace. Thank you all very much.